the enclosure acts result in all those keep off the grass signs? The signs of any a seed planter, didn't Jethro Tell also have a string of rockets? Without turnips, would anyone have been able to just fall off the turnip truck? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Markenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the conditions that allowed the Industrial Revolution to first start in Great Britain, how the scientific revolution led to new ways and products to farm and new technology with which to farm, leading to rising crop yields and how this revolution in food production led to a rising population, allowing for both more demand for products and more workers to produce them. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video, so make sure to stick around for that. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe on that little bell thingy so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. The biggest change in human history since the discovery of agriculture, the Industrial Revolution, was characterized by the replacement of human and animal labor by machinery, the organization of production and factories, manufacturing specialization, and new patterns of life. Those steps towards industrialization occurred in China centuries before it took place in Europe, as you can see here a puddling furnace from the 13th century, a Chinese version of the blast furnace from the same period, and of course, mining equipment and pumping up and bringing, bringing water out of the mines. Nonetheless, the Industrial Revolution occurred first in Great Britain for a number of key reasons. First off, the legacy of the English Revolution, especially the Glorious Revolution which you can find out in another video of mine, but where King Jim II was kicked out and replaced by the Dutch King Bill and Mary, seen here, which allowed for internal peace and government controlled by landowners and merchants dedicated to the sacredness of private property. In other words, the government couldn't simply at any time it wished and on any whim of its own take away your property. If it did, it had to compensate you at fair market value. In other words, this breeds confidence for investment. You can afford to invest for the long term because the government, as soon as you start making money off it, isn't simply going to take it away from you. Second, Britain's overseas commerce in commodities and spices, such as sugar, coffee, chocolate, tea, cotton, vanilla, tobacco, pepper, cloves, and other spices. And of course, the slave trade. The slaves needed to grow and harvest the crops in the Caribbean colonies, not just for Britain, but for France and the Dutch and others as well. All of this provided capital needed for investment in new technological ventures. Third, most of these profits were at first plowed back into agrarian concerns in Britain by merchants and planters who desire the status of landed gentry, who at the exact same time were caught up in the scientific revolution of the 17th century. 
and through local learned societies were attempting to better the yield and profit of their lands by experimenting with new kinds of crops, such as clover and fodder, grown in new kinds of ways, abandoning the old three-field rotation where one field just sits there and produces nothing, and instead producing clover or alfalfa in it to both renew the soil and get a crop off of it. One way was to consolidate land by using the local sheriff to evict tenants. These would be the former serfs who farmed the old medieval way with the strips out in the open field and resisted new farming methods. Again, did not embrace the farming method where all fields were planted. And the landlords did this through thousands of enclosure acts passed by a parliament which was dominated by themselves, the landlords. They also invested in technology, such as Joseph Foljam's Rotherham Plow of 1730, which allowed for better, well, plowing. Jethro Tull's Mechanical Sea Planter, and here's Jethro Tull, looking considerably different than his album covers of the 1970s. This, of course, being his seed planter. So the seed directly went into the furrow and was immediately covered up. Instead of the sower just tossing it on and hopefully our harrow would come back beyond it immediately to cover up before the birds eat it. And Andrew Michaels, 1783 automatic thresher. These and other improvements led to higher crop yields, two to three times medieval levels, which you see here. The medieval crop yields tended to be low between three to five, and here's Britain's. Notice suddenly around being the 17th century, it really starts to grow up and never looks back. Whereas the other countries, France, Spain, Italy, Central Europe and Scandinavia and Eastern Europe just kind of lag behind. We're just producing the same yields as in the medieval times. Despite kings like Fred the Great of Prussia trying to get his peasants to grow potatoes. Anyway, this allowed England to produce a surplus for export between 1660 and 1760 when a rising population began to require fruit food imports. These new developments also led to the rise of agricultural wage laborers, driving the rest into the cities to work in the new mills and factories or to emigrate abroad, primarily to America. So by the end of the 17th century, only 60% of the population was engaged in food production instead of the previous 90% which it had been nearly since time immemorial, falling to 36% by 1800 and 10% by 1900, which is what you see here. And today it's much less, it's even less than 5%. And the 19th century saw yet greater improvements, dwarfing all previous advances. Or by then, America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Uruguay, and Argentina could provide food at prices cheaper than Europe itself, in part from their immense natural resources and arable lands, in part from a transport revolution, for which see the later video, which for the first time made it possible to ship produce overseas without worry of spoilage. So, agrarian improvements, more and more nutritious food, combined with a generation's worth of good weather in the early 18th century, led to a population explosion of workers who forced off the land because of the thousands of enclosure acts, needed both jobs and the manufactured goods to which they had been accustomed since the late Middle Ages. 
as food became more plentiful, a Europe of about 145 million in 1700. And here you see the demographic chart. Europe, at the time of the Roman Empire, this is a bit of a early plague, rising, black plague, and then sort of holding steady as a plateau. And suddenly, around 1700, beginning to really rise and expand. And you see this here as well, the total population. Uh, these are just estimates, but, uh, and then the urban population, notice urban population had always been low in a pre-industrial society. Pre-modern society, pretty much 10% or less of the population. Now look at it, by 1900, a third of the population, and today it continues. So, a Europe of about 145 million in the year 1700, rose to about 415 million by the year 1900. Despite having some 50 million people emigrate at the same time overseas, primarily in the 19th century. Another key factor was earlier marriages, which was able to exist for many of the workers, those who had formerly been peasants, because now in the factories they are getting regular wages. Also, more and better food and medical advances, especially in the 19th century, and better hygiene, all contributed to rising population as infant and mortality rates fell. So, towns and cities grew spectacularly particularly in the 19th century. In less than a century, London grew nearly five times, five times over, from 1 million to about 4.7 million people. Paris grew from 500,000 in the year 1800, the time of Napoleon, to 3.6 million a century later. In Berlin, at the time of Fred the Great and his successor, grew from 170,000 to 2.7 million people. And many places, which in the Middle Ages had been mere hamlets, having simply no more than 50 people, if that, such as Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, Sheffield, and Liverpool, grew overnight into vast urban wastelands. By 1900, Glasgow, Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Vienna also had more than a million people, and 17 more cities had over half a million inhabitants, a figure first passed by London and Paris only in the year 1800. Hey, don't fear the reaper. And here is the wrap-up quote. Thirteen years ago, James Croft began his farming by taking an acre of moor, which he pared and burnt, spread lime among the ashes, and sowed it with oats. He next planted half with potatoes, and sowed the other half with mixed rye and wheat combined. After another liming, he sowed it with oats, the crop producing 35 bushels. After the oats were off, he mixed some lime and earth together and spread it over the land. The grass came up very finely and has been exceedingly good ever since, and improving every year. It is now worth 203 pounds an acre. Potatoes he has regularly cultivated. He has five acres of grass. His flock of cattle is three milk cows, a heifer, and his Galloway bull. Their winter food being hay, turnips and straw. He makes six pounds of butter per cow per week. Arthur Young, 1771. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe as it will help me bring you more great videos just like this one and click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next history awaits for no one video is posted
If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.